Hebrews chapter 11 is where we find our text this morning, and thank you for bringing your Bibles and being interested in what the Bible says. The book of Hebrews is a unique book of the Bible, especially in the New Testament, because we do not know definitely who the author was. God tells us that Matthew wrote Matthew, and Mark wrote Mark, and Luke wrote Luke, and John wrote the book of John. He tells us the book of Acts is written by Luke, and Romans by Paul. And the, the many of the Pauline epistles, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, by Peter. The Revelation was written by Apostle John. But the book of Hebrews, God does not tell us who wrote it, what the human, who the human author was. We know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. He's the one who wrote the Bible. Those are not men's words. But as keeping in order with God's way, he uses human instrumentality. Just like if you wrote a letter, you would not give credence to the pen who wrote the letter. You wouldn't say, I got a letter from this pen. you say, I got a letter from so-and-so, and the pen was merely an instrument. Well, that's exactly how God gave us the Bible. If you were to write a letter this big, you'd need more than one pen, too. He used 40 different ink pens, if you will, human instruments, to say what he wanted said. Most of those he gives, and we can see their, they, the nature or the, the personality of the person writing it. But the book of Hebrews was not the case. We're not sure. Most people would say the Apostle Paul was the human author. And if I had to guess, that's who I would guess was the author. But I don't want to be loud where God's quiet. And I certainly don't want to be quiet where God's loud. And so we don't know. But I think there's good reason why that we don't know the human author. It's because if you know who wrote something, you automatically draw a parallel. Oh, I can tell. That, I, that sounds just like him or her. And this book was written specifically to the Jewish people who had left Judaism, who used to sacrifice animals at the temple, and used to, but now Jesus was the final sacrifice. He offered himself once and for all. There was no need for another sacrifice. But that was a part of their culture. They were used to that. They used to go to church and there they would have a high priest with beautiful garments, linen ephod, and an ephod in the front, and a special hat that he had, and, and special rituals, and, and the joy that would come for him teaching them God's word and sacrificing for the people. But now they really didn't need him to intercede for them because... There's now just one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And Jesus became that high priest, if you will, who went in and offered his own blood on heaven's mercy seats once for all. And now they didn't need that, that high priest again to intercede for them. They could go right to God through Jesus Christ. But they still missed that. They missed the worship that was entailed there. And they loved the law, and the Old Testament, and up until that time, that's all they had. It was the Old Testament and the Old Covenant that God had given their forefathers, Moses in particular. And now there was a new covenant. Their pastor used to be the high priest, and all the garb that would go with that and the ritual. And now they were not, their pastor was a common fisherman like Peter, James, and John was a fellow just like them who really dressed just like they dressed and told things differently. Yes, they moved in the Old Testament into their messages, but they also, they had been with Jesus and he had given them new instruction. They were used to going to the temple, and now they're meeting in backyards and different location, marketplaces, anywhere great crowds could gather and listen to a common man preach the word of God. It was new to them. 
And the persecution was new. If you today got saved yesterday and you're going to get baptized today, when you get baptized all over this auditorium, people who are mature and interested and spiritually concerned about the fact that, that you're getting baptized and they want to rejoice with you, when you come up out of that water, people are going to say, Amen! Great! Praise the Lord! And there was people at their baptism that did that, but when they went home, it was a total different story. When they went back to the house, dad was not happy. When he found out that his son had followed this Jesus Christ, who as far as he was concerned, was dead and a heretic. When mom and the wife came in and said, honey, I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I know I have eternal life now. I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. The husband wasn't rejoicing. Matter of fact, he was angry. And often would divorce his wife at the next opportunity. And now instantly you have many people who are alone who once were married. You had kids who had inheritance coming and... and opportunities to live in their dad's home and, and enjoy that house for their children who now, it was over. Parents would have a funeral for their son or daughter who got baptized, identifying with Jesus from Judaism. And the people, quite frankly, were scratching their heads and saying, you know what? I wonder if Jesus is really better. I mean, I know he is. We have the Spirit of God inside of us, but man, I missed what we had before. And now dad has rejected me. We can't go and gather at holidays anymore. He won't even acknowledge my existence. Now there's, there is persecution. And now dad has been killed for the cause of Christ. And some of those situations have taken place. And, and there, were, there, were, there were fatherless children. And, and quite frankly, the persecution caused them to wonder, is it really worth it? to serve Jesus and leave what we left to come to the Lord. And the whole book of Hebrews is written to say this, is whatever you lost and whatever you gave up to serve Jesus, Jesus is better. Christ is worth it. And strategically, the author, the human author of the book of Hebrews says in chapter 1, angels. Jesus is better than angels. Moses. Jesus is better than Moses. The law. Jesus fulfilled the law. He's better. The Old Testament sacrifices. Jesus is a better sacrifice. And the priest. He says, look, you now have a high priest. You don't have a priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of your infirmity, but was at all points tempted like you and yet without sin. The wonderful thing about, and this is interesting, you, you know, may or may not know this, but the high priest had no, when he went to work to sacrifice many, many animals throughout the day was part of his responsibilities. It was a tough job. Matter of fact, after 50, they stopped doing that and took on a super, uh, supervisory role. In, in helping other guys because it was difficult to kill animal after animal and sacrifice and all of that. But another thing that made it difficult, there was no place for the high priest to sit down. He was on his feet from the time he got to work until he got down. Now, most of us who work, thank God, you have a little time to sit down. But if you can imagine, there was no place in the temple for the high priest to rest or sit down. And yet it's interesting, the Bible says after Jesus offered, he is set down at the right hand of the Father. Why is he set down? Because he's done. The sacrifice is done. It's paid. It's paid in full. It is finished. But Jesus was better than that. And then he begins to tell other things that Jesus is better than and, and tries to convince them of that. And in chapter number 10, he tells them, because of this, let us draw near with a clean heart and let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together like a manner of some is. Don't stop going to church, he told them. 
Just because Jesus paid for your sin, well, listen, that's all the more reason why you should be in church together. If you say, well, the temple's that not big of a deal, so what's the big deal about going down and hearing an average guy speak to us? He said, look, be even more faithful as you see the day approaching. He said, let's consider one another. Let's think about my brothers and sisters in Christ and provoke them to love God and others more and do more for God and others. Amen. He talked about keeping yourself pure in chapter 10. And then in chapter 11... He goes through what we call, those of you who are familiar with your scriptures, chapter 11 of Hebrews is the hall of faith. It is great Christians that we know about in the Old Testament, and then toward the end of the chapter, many people that we do not know about who have suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. Yesterday and already this morning, in this world of 7 billion people, there have been martyrs. There have been people who have given their life for no other reason that they believed in Jesus. We in America, it's somewhat foreign to us here, but it's not foreign in Saudi Arabia. It's not foreign in Sudan. It's not foreign in Yemen. It's not foreign in many countries of our world where persecution in India and other places where people give their life daily. And it is the blood of martyrs, they say, that have propagated the gospel. Well, Jesus was better, and he, he goes in chapter 11 and says, let me tell you some people who believe that Jesus was better. And they did so by faith. This morning, I'd like to speak to you about the topic of faith. I think it's a confusing topic for many. Sometimes we have heard people say, just believe. Just have faith, man. But may I say to you, we have, we fall in love with having faith in faith. But having faith, I mean, I've, I've been to some places where people believe God's a doorknob. Just believe it, man. But let me tell you, your object of your faith is very important. Who your faith is in. I was yesterday out telling folks about Christ with two other friends of mine and and one man said, the, I said, do you, the people asked me one time, do you know for sure? He said, uh, well, do you believe in Jesus? I said, yes, but so does the devil. The devil believes in Jesus. He believes about him here. He has a, a mental assent to who he is. But that does not mean you're saved because you have a mental assent of who he is. No more than I can say that chair holds me up. If I sit on that chair, it would hold me up. I have not exercised faith in that chair until I sit in that chair and put my, my weight on that chair. Well, faith must have an object. And here in this passage of Scripture, the Bible begins to tell us a little bit about faith. I think it's one of the sins of our day. There are many sins in the modern day Baptist church like we go to. One of those is the sin of worldliness. We're just, there's no difference between the holy and profane. We watch the same things the world watches. We're entertained with the same things. We, we, we may tame down a few things, but we, we are, we're, there's not much difference between how the unsaved world acts and how we act. And the Bible gives us very clear understanding. He said, now come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Worldliness is a problem, certainly. And something that's not, we can't stop fighting it. We're going to have to continue to fight it. Because it's in me. I have a natural affection for the things of this world. I'm very curious about worldly things. And I think anyone who's honest would say, yes, me too. It's not hard to be curious of what's happening, happening in, in Hollywood. It's not, it's not hard to be curious what's happened in, in rich people's lives, in the lives of the wealthy and famous. We're very interested in that. But God says, love not the world, John. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Amen. It's diametrically opposed to that. But it's one of the sins that I face and you face. And our children definitely face it. That's why moms and dads and young couples, good night in the morning, listen to me. If you're raising children, you protect their, you protect their environment. Do that. 
It may not affect you, but it will affect your children. Man, you can't, you don't have to teach a two-year-old to dance. They know how. They're very attracted to music that's questionable and, and this world. And you don't have to get them and say, no, please watch the television. No, no, no. It's very attracted to them. The things of this world are very attracted to them. Worldless is a problem. I think carelessness with the gospel is a problem. Most of us who are saved are glad when someone gets saved. But many of us do very little to make that happen. We do not expose people to the gospel of Christ. We're glad to know somebody is sharing the gospel. with just that somebody hasn't been us for a long time. And it's a sin. It's a sin that's not happened. It's a sin that there's not desires for it to happen. And I think we're above normal. We're above average. But we're way below what God's normal is. I think this church is a great soul winning church and it's been that way for many years. And we're above, the, we're above average, but we're way below where normal should be in regards to our soul winning fervor. We may be above average in, 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 our, in our lifestyle and our, and our, our, our holiness and conduct, but I believe oftentimes many of us are way below normal where God's normal wants us to be. And I don't want to be there. But I think another sin of our society, another sin of our churches today, and this pastor, is faithlessness. Failing to believe God. Failing to trust God enough to obey Him. Bottom line. Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, God gives us a little bit of His opinion about what faith is. I guess you would also have to c conclude what, is, what, is, what faith is not. Faith is not just being positive. Oh, that person's so positive. Now, I like being around positive people. Some people brighten the room by walking out. <laughs> and I really don't like being around that kind of a guy. I want to be in a room with somebody who's positive. Not always saying, that don't work. That stinks. Hear about the little guy... His parents or his kids joke with him, put Limburger cheese on his nose, under his mustache. He woke up and he said, the bedroom stinks. Walked out in the living room, he said, the living room stinks. Walked in the kitchen, he said, honey, the kitchen stinks. He walked outside, he said, the whole world stinks. Well, he did not know it was, it's him that's stinking. I think that's many, many testimonies of many folks. You don't like every, you don't like this, we don't like that, we don't like that, and everybody has to live with you not liking everything. I don't like to be around negative people, but let me say you, positive people and faith-filled people, there is some similarities, but faith is not just being positive. Certainly there is, there is a, an issue there. Faith is not just feeling something. I can tell you, sometimes when I sit down with Linda and we start thinking about what we're going to tithe and give to the Lord, I don't always feel good. It doesn't always, I mean, I don't, I don't get a little bubbly little feeling and say, oh, this, I can't just hop around to church. <laughs> I, don't sit in, I don't sit in my Bible every morning and say, boy, I can't wait to get in the scriptures today. Now, there are some days like that. Maybe Brother Colson has all the time when he's not watching the Cubs. Every time he gets to the pulpit, he talks about sports and stuff. Brother Colson. No. Now, he probably gets along with God and just, just revels in that. I don't think he probably does all the time. Because our feelings are deceiving. The Bible says our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Rare is the person. I have done that a few times. I said, Lord, I'm looking forward to getting your word today and seeing what you have for me. But most of the time I have to make myself get in the Word and then I feel good. Faith is not just feeling something. I mean, I say feelings follow faith. Sir, if you wait to love your wife till you feel like it, you're going to be a lousy lover. No, you love because God told you to and your feelings will catch up later. If you wait, ma'am, to reverence and, and respond uh, respectfully to your husband when he deserves it, it's never going to happen. You're never going to feel like reverencing him. 
But you do it because God told you to, and then feelings will catch up with your faith. If you wait until your finances dictate that you can afford to tithe and give an offering and give to missions, you'll never give. But when we obey God, then our feelings follow our faith. If you wait till you feel like going soul winning, you'll sit on your backside and your blessed assurance and do nothing. You're not going to do that. But faith has some elements I think God tells us. Let's look at it real quickly if we can. Chapter 11, verse number 1. It's not a leap in the dark, it's step in the light. Faith is not faith in faith, it is faith in God. But verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I'm not going to pretend to tell you that I under, understand everything about what I just read to you. Now some people, you ask them, what is faith? The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen? What does that mean? I don't know. Now, we know what the Bible says. I think it would be good for us to evaluate a few of those words. What does substance mean? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Of course, sub means underlying, something you can lean on, something that is underneath you that stabilizes you. It's, a, it's just like a, Brother uh, Jared and Miss... Um, Emily played the, the, the song, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and right on Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. Well, that substance is, is what, you, what you have, and I think that, that that particular thought has to do also with, like if you were going to buy a house, they would ask you for earnest money. They would ask you for a down payment. And then it secures you. It is the substance that you have. They want to say, what is your substance? Do you have proof that you can buy this house? Do you have, down, do you have a down payment? Well, I think that has to do with confidence or assurance. It is the assurance of what I believe is true. And it begins with confidence. And then it is the evidence of things not seen. That has to do more so with conviction. It's the evidence. It's things I know that are happening. Now it's, by the way, these people, they did not have the New Testament. The folks we're going to speak about, Abel, Enoch, Noah, they didn't have the Bible. None of those guys ever woke up and read their Bible. They did not have a scriptures to turn to. We live in a wonderful day to serve God. Now they did too, but we have the Bible now. These guys never woke up one time and read the Bible. None, neither of these guys went to church and listened to their pastor preach the Bible. But they did serve God for the same reason that you and I should serve God is because we have God's Word. And the confidence we have leads to a conviction that leads to really to the Word of God, the communication from God. That's why I just encourage people to read the Bible. Trust the Bible. Listen, if you, if, if you don't spend time in the Bible, they said a week without the Bible, a, a, a time without the Bible, seven days without the Bible makes one week, W-E-A-K. And you're going to be weak if you don't spend time in the Scriptures. I'm so pleased that any of you would stop, get ready, drive here, come on a bus, get ready and come to this service. And I know many of you, when I think about some of our men in the, in the wheelchairs and uh, some folks who are paralyzed, how much more time they have to do to get ready to get here, the time that their, their loved ones and them have to, to do to get it to a, this service. My heart is so grateful for health, number one, but also so full, full with admiration for those who have to work harder to get here. And I thank you for coming, but I say to you, don't substitute your church attendance for, for the reading of the scriptures every day. Get into the Bible. Let the Bible get in you. But faith is generated from the scriptures, but it begins with a confidence in what God says. It continues with a conviction of things I have not seen. Let me give you an example of that. You know... I was witnessing to someone yesterday, and they got saved yesterday. I was so happy to see someone come to know the Lord. But it amazes me when I asked them the third question. I say, now, do you believe that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again? And they say, yes. And I say, I do too. Have you ever seen Jesus? No. I didn't see him die, didn't see him buried, didn't see him rise again. But faith has brought me from the substance of the word of God to to agree and have the conviction. If someone said to me, John, 
if you say that you believe that Jesus died on the cross, and, and if, you, if, if you'll just deny that, I'll give you a million dollars. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. Why? Because I'm convicted that Jesus is real, Amen. though I've never seen him. So faith is the substance. It's God's word bringing conviction to my heart, and then I respond more so with more communication from God. Look at verse number two, if you will, please. The Bible says this, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Now, that doesn't mean they got a good report card. That means that they got God's word too. But you know, we're gonna talk about three of those guys in just a moment, but one of those guys is Abel, who sacrificed an animal. The other guy walked with God. He could not see, but he walked with God. Noah built an ark. Do you know why all those guys did that? Because God told them to do it. They just had a word from God. That's it. But he said the older guys that served God, the elders, they obtained a good report. They got the word, God's word on it. By the way, if you got God's word on it, take it to the bank and cash it. It'll cash every time. If God tells you to do it and your feelings tell you not to do it, do it. I don't know if I should forgive them. They might mess me over again. Be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgive one another, even as God for Christ has forgiven you. That says, do it. You don't feel like forgiving? Forgive. Why? Because God told you to. Whatever that area, I mean, you don't feel like tithing? Tithe. Why? Because God told you to. Just do it. It will work. Whatever God tells us to do, we should do it. Because we have God's word on it. Verse number three, and then it goes back to, it says, through the faith, we understand that the world were for, framed by the what? He puts the emphasis on the scriptures. Now, how do you think the whole world came into existence? Every beautiful tree you see out there, every beautiful uh, sunrise or sunset, you look up into a sky and you see those curious clouds go by, serious clouds, or come, how does that all happen? That happened because God spoke into existence. Amen. And the Lord God said, let there be, let there be. He said, look, God, if God can form the whole world with speaking, he can certainly do something in your heart if you'll obey the Bible. Amen. Then in verse number four, he begins with a man, and our time is gonna fly by, but let's just real quickly look at this. Abel, by faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by he, yet, yet and, and excuse me, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. Our time will probably stop with this gentleman, but let's speak about the man Abel. See, Abel is mentioned, his story is in Genesis 4. Enoch's story is in Genesis 5, and Noah's story is in Genesis 6. And the first example God wanted you to focus on and me to focus on was this guy Abel. Now, Abel was probably the twin brother of Cain. Brother Tom Williams and others believe that they were probably twins. Abel and Cain were the first, firstborn of, 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 uh, of the union of, of Adam and Eve. And Abel and Cain were brothers, and, and of course, their, their, their parents had sinned, and and so, no doubt, they got the word from God, from dad, uh, that now, annually, they need to kill an animal in sacrifice for their sins. Now, the animal would not forgive their sins, but their act would be a act of faith that they believe that Jesus one day would come and take away the sins of the world. And so, every year, they were given a sacrifice. It was a time to sacrifice. Now, Abel was a shepherd. He cared for sheep, and, and it was not easy for him to find the first things of his flock. But he found the first one, and he brought it, and he put it on an altar. He pulls its head back and, and then cuts its throat and begins to bleed. And he begins to sacrifice that animal. Not easy for him or anyone, but especially the one who saw him born and cared for the sheep. And yet he, he, he did it. Not only thing he had to go on is what God told him. Now Cain, on the other hand, Cain was more of a vegetable farmer. He was a fellow who worked the ground. He didn't do sheep. He didn't like sheep. He liked vegetables and 
tomatoes and those kinds of things. He enjoyed seeing, overcoming the laws that now they were facing with the, with the, the curse of sin and, and seeing good vegetables and good plants grow. That, that really energized him. And when it came time to sacrifice, instead of putting uh, what God asked him to do as a lamb, Cain got a fruit basket, a vegetable basket. I don't think he took spoiled vegetables. I think he took the best that he could find. And he got a vegetable basket and he put that on top of the altar and said, Lord, I want you to take this as my sacrifice to you. I worked hard for this. It wasn't easy since you cursed the world. Forget that. But that's the best I could give you. And the Lord says, no, no, Cain, you, you do not do well. And it, instead of re repenting and, and seeing, you know, this is God's way, Cain got angry and eventually killed his brother Abel. By the way, there's no telling what happens when you get angry. That's why the Bible says the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And don't blame your anger on your ancestry. Amen. Well, I'm Irish. So is a lot of people. It's not a reason for that. Amen. It's sin. The Bible says put it away. Don't do it. If God tells you something, you can do it. You can do anything you're supposed to do. But in anger, he killed his brother Abel. That's the story, but God's telling us here now, look, just like Abel, and he starts with salvation, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. Why was it more excellent? Ah, it was nasty, it was dirty, it was bloody. It was cruel and brutal. It wasn't, what wasn't excellent about it? It was excellent because God asked him for that. And basically, that's the same way that Christianity competes, Bible Christianity competes with the rest of the world. If you put all of the world system together, how can I get to heaven from here? They're going to either give you a lamb or works. You're going to get, either get Jesus and he's the way, truth, and life or things you need to do. Let me tell you something, friend. God will not take your works. He will not take my works. That's why Jesus said very emphatically in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father. That means you'll not be the exception, I'll not be the exception, except through Jesus Christ. Amen. Only through Jesus you can have eternal life. Amen. Well, Cain didn't like that idea. He wanted to give his works. I say, I'll stop with this message this morning, but let me just say to you, do you know for sure you've come by the way of the cross? Have you accepted the gift of eternal life? Not your works. Just a reminder, God's salvation is not a reward for being righteous. It's a gift for being guilty. You do not earn eternal life. But the Bible calls salvation obeying the gospel, submitting to God's plan, and that was Jesus Christ. If you're here today, you're not sure if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. Please don't go to hell from this message. There's nothing in the world worth going to hell over. Your pride is certainly one of those. If you're saying, I'm not sure, speaking to a man yesterday, it was such a blessing. We got quiet after we were out telling folks about Christ. He said, Pastor, I don't think I'm saved. Would you mind showing me how to be saved? What a joy it was to explain the gospel to that precious man. You know what? He had to humble himself. He had already told me about 30 minutes earlier that he was saved. And he came back 30 minutes later and he said, you know, Pastor, I think I need to get saved. He didn't let his pride. You know, there's two reasons why people go to hell, oftentimes over pride and procrastination. They have to accept God will not accept anything from you to have eternal life. When someone gets saved, God has to do all the work. He's not going to take your little fruit basket. He's not going to take your works. He'll only take faith in his son, Jesus Christ. If you're here today, you're not sure about that, I hope you'll get that taken care of. Because Abel is God's example of faith that worships. And you can't worship God until you know God through his person of his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, can we?